Well, hello there. It is my great honor to introduce your next speaker. But before I do, what about that last speaker, Dr. Dean Shirzai? Was he great? Yeah. And isn't he handsome? Kind of like a modern day Omar Sharif. Wouldn't you love to eat at the Shirzai's dinner table, play ping pong while you're eating, write on the walls? I wasn't able to do any of that stuff growing up. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Aisha Shirzai, the other half. I'm not going to say better half, the other half. And I could read what it says here. She's a neurologist, blah, 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 director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program. Yeah, you know, all this stuff. We know she's smart. But who cares about the science if it doesn't taste good? Because the thing with Dr. Aisha, she's a triple threat. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. But she can cook. If you watch her lives that she does on Instagram, on Facebook, her food is mouthwatering. You have to get this book. Her recipes are delicious. They're familiar. And all I can, and she's one of the nicest people in the world. You know, I actually had a head injury in 2020, and she was my neurologist, and she sent me a present. She sent me puzzles and books. Wouldn't it be cool if all your doctors, like, did that, you know, just sent you a gift afterwards? Anyway, you are going to love this presentation. She cooks as good as she looks. Please welcome Dr. Aisha Sherzai. I'm starstruck because Chef AJ is one of my favorite people in the world. So I didn't know that she was actually introducing me. So what an honor and a gift. I love you, Chef AJ. Thank you. Um, when Daniel asked us whether we want to do a cooking demonstration, I usually go to talks, you know, for a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm pretty good at bringing forth the science. But what we're passionate about is the translation of that science. Okay, so great. You know, scientists talk about what is important for your brain health, but how does that apply to your life? That's what we're really passionate about. So without a second, we said, yes, we're going to do a cooking demonstration. Absolutely. So Daniel and Jessica, thank you so much for having us and for, you know, creating this environment so that we can talk about food, which is the most important environment, internal environment. Because if you think about it, it's something that we put in our body three or four times a day, depending on how many times you eat. So it literally is the building block of our brain, of our body. And not to make it sound too drastic, but whatever we eat, it either helps our brain to stay in a thrive mode instead of damage control mode, or it actually causes a lot of damage and our body, instead of growing, instead of thriving, gets busy trying to reduce the damage that the food causes. So it's very important for us to, to inculcate healthy habits and healthy eating into our lives. And when I was uh, training as a neurologist, so I'm a neurologist, I see patients. I, I work in the neurology clinic. I also work in the emergency room, but I realized I was giving away more recipes than aspirin and cholesterol medication and other medications. Medications are important, but I saw that it would actually make a huge difference if people knew how to eat better. So while I was a fellow at Columbia University, I decided, I was like, oh, I'm learning how to cook, and I better, I better know how to do it well. So I'd be in the ICU in my scrubs in the morning in the neuro ICU at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and at 7 p.m. at night, I would take the train downtown in New York and go down to a culinary institute until 10 p.m., and in two years, I, might, I got my culinary degree. So those recipes that I was printing out on the Internet, just scrambling the Internet, I actually wrote my own recipes, and I tried to share it with them. And nothing has been more fulfilling in my life than to share good food with people. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Great. Um, so today, you know, this is not a kitchen, but Daniel and Jessica were so kind to, you know, create that environment where I could actually show you guys very quick and easy recipes that you can make on a weeknight. I have two children and I'm very busy. I believe in easy, healthy, and tasty meals that you can put together in 20 minutes, that is fresh, that helps you think better, that gives you all the energy in the world, but doesn't leave a trail of disaster in the kitchen. You know, you don't want your kitchen to look like a war zone. You want to just kick up your feet and just relax at the end of the day. So those are the kind of recipes that I believe in. And Dean and I, my lovely husband, we, we wrote this book together and we put all the recipes in there. So the recipes that were chosen for today's dinner and for the demonstration are a wonderful butternut squash and a chickpea curry. I love curries. So I lived in different countries growing up. I lived in Japan. I lived in Italy. I lived in India. 
And curry is something that has, you know, you can actually have variations of curry wherever you go. And it's this beautiful sauce where the vegetables are coated with wonderful spices and wonderful vegetables. And you can serve it on brown rice. You can eat it with whole wheat bread. You can top it off on some other root vegetables like sweet potatoes or regular potatoes. And it just tastes so good. So we chose this curry. And of course, we had to do something with greens, right? I don't know if Dean actually touched on the importance of greens. And tomorrow I have a nutrition talk with you guys. So we'll kind of get a little geeky and wonky there with the science. But Eating greens is one of the most beautiful things we can do for our brain health. So we wanted to make a kale salad. I absolutely love kale, and I hope you love this recipe too. So we're going to go ahead and start with the butternut squash curry. Now, the ingredients include, obviously, all whole vegetables. So we have butternut squash, about two cups. Now, I'm not going to tell you the measurements of all of these wonderful vegetables because the way my mom taught me and I actually forgot about it while I was in culinary school, is you actually just see and feel things. You don't really measure anything after a while, okay? So I do have the recipe open up here just so that I could glance and see how many tablespoons of certain things I've said, but I'll just, you know, feel for it, all right? So we have butternut squash, we have spinach, we have chickpeas, and we have an array of different spices, obviously turmeric, and then we're going to use a red curry paste to kind of give those flavors, but I'll talk about how you can actually make your own curry pastes. Garlic and ginger go there for flavor. And this is a wonderful example that you don't really need salt and sugar and other foods that are added in processed foods to make them palatable. If you use herbs like cilantro and mint, if you use alliums like ginger and garlic and onion, and if you put a beautiful combination of all of these together, you really don't need sugar. You really don't need salt. Taste is not taste. Taste is actually habit. And the more you're exposed to the right foods, you actually develop taste for it. You can, you can develop a different habit of taste for it. So we're going to show you guys how you can develop different flavors. All right, so the most important thing in curries is the base, right? If you know how to create a good base, you've got it. Whether it's in French cooking, you know, where you have a combination of carrots and onions and celery, or whether it's in Indian cooking where you have a combination of onions, ginger, garlic, some herbs and spices, and different, different cuisines. The base is everything. Sometimes when you see some cooking shows, they're just dumping everything together and they're letting it sit. We're going to add flavors layer by layer by layer, all right? So the first thing we're going to do is typically, you know, people put a lot of oil in the pan so that they can start caramelizing their vegetables or their alliums. You really don't have to. Now, as far as oil is concerned, I'll talk about it tomorrow as far as the Mediterranean diet studies are concerned and, you know, what information we have. But it's a very high calorie food. And especially most of us who are trying to reduce calories, it's good to reduce it as much as possible. A healthy diet can be good without oil or with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. And it is only used for taste and texture, but you really don't have to. And if you know how to cook well, you can actually cook foods without any oil. But regardless, we have some you know, extra virgin olive oil. The one that I actually like using is in the spray canister because it's much controlled. You don't just guzzle down a lot of oil. And what I'm going to do is just basically spray the pan a little bit. That's it. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want the onions and the garlic to not stick to the pan. If you have a nonstick pan, that's fine. But this is actually going to caramelize it a little bit and make it easier for us, for, for the tastes to come out. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and add the onions. The wonderful people in the kitchen already cut a lot of the vegetables for me here, so there's not a lot of chopping. Now, making sure that the heat is not too high, you don't want things to burn. And having some water or some vegetable broth ready next to you. We're going to use some organic vegetable broth. You can actually use a low sodium one, which is much better. I'll talk about why it's important to reduce sodium in our foods and diet. And just adding a little bit so that it can help the cooking process. All right, so while this is cooking, let me talk to you guys about salt. Now, salt has been associated with a lot of cardiovascular diseases 
as well as neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. What salt does is it causes the inner linings of our arteries to kind of slough off. It damages the endothelium, which is a very thin cellular layer on the inner sides of our arteries. And over time, when that inner layer gets damaged, the arteries tend to harden up. There's a term that is, you know, that's usually referred to as atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic disease tends to cause a lot of different health problems, whether it's heart disease, whether it's uh, kidney disease, whether it's Alzheimer's disease. We may have talked about white matter disease. You know, these are the damage that is caused to the smaller blood vessels in our brain. Our brain is a very vascular organ. So cutting down on salt, which is usually found in a lot of processed foods, is a very important thing to do. And yes, you know, initially when somebody's not really used to it, that might be difficult. But over time, again, with the addition of flavorful herbs and spices, it gets easier and easier to the point where if you get used to not eating salt, once there's a little bit of salt in your diet, just thrown off. You can't eat it anymore. All right, so I'm going to smash some garlic here. And I kind of get violent with my garlic sometimes, like just smashing it like that. And growing up in Italy, we were used to eating a whole lot of garlic. Um, garlic is amazing. Some of the studies actually show that garlic reduces blood pressure. It has been extrapolated a little bit beyond the data, but it's such an amazing thing to add for flavor and for reducing the need to add salt and sugar and things of that nature. So we're going to add a little bit of garlic here. I kind of, you know, intentionally reduce the heat here because I'm talking to you guys. There's no such thing as multitasking. There's doing multiple things badly. So just want to make sure that I don't burn this. That would be embarrassing. So I'm just going to cook it in low heat, slowly and gradually, and let the flavors come together. You're perfect. Now, on top of that, we're going to add a little bit of ginger. Now, let me see where my spoon is. Here it is. All right, so this is, I believe this is a little over two tablespoons of ginger, but I'm just going to add about a tablespoon of it here and mix it with that beautiful um, ginger and onions just to give it flavor. As far as ginger and garlic and all the other alien vegetables are concerned, they're amazing. They have anti-inflammatory products and properties. And when you eat vegetables like this, where they're slowly cooked and they're under your control and you know what's in them, that's medicine. In our book, we have seven rules of eating healthy for brain health. And believe it or not, the, one of the rules is cook a meal at home. Cook a meal at home. Why is that? It's because you actually know. <laughs> He's saying it smells so good I can't concentrate. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great compliment. But when you cook at home, you have more control over things that you, you, know, you, you put in your body. So it's such a beautiful thing to cook. In my opinion, and I'm biased because cooking is something that I absolutely love, it's almost like meditation where you disconnect from the world and you just kind of dive into the beautiful smells and the sights of these wonderful vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts and seeds. All right, so this is it. This is basically the base. Onion, garlic, and ginger is one of the most common base for most recipes in Asian cuisine, um, Southeastern cuisine, um, and even in, in sometimes in um, European cuisines. So if you know how to make this, and there's not a lot of work to it. As you saw, I added the onion first and then the garlic and the ginger. You don't want to put all of them together because ginger and garlic tend to cook quickly or quicker than onions. So what will happen is the onions will stay raw while the ginger and the garlic will burn, and that imparts a very bitter taste. So you don't want to do that. You just want to take your time and add it uh, one at a time. All right. Beautiful. Now, as far as flavor goes, we're going to use this red curry paste. Now, this is common, relatively common. You can find it anywhere. Um, and it comes in jars, and it's a combination of different spices um, and different vegetables. You know, sometimes they add 
um, uh, you know, red chilies, um, ginger, lemongrass, depending on what kind of curry paste it is. And this seems to be a Thai curry paste. Uh, and it's also, this one actually has makrut lime zest, which is like these green lime, lime smelling, uh, you know, herbs, which are very, very pungent. And it imparts such a beautiful flavor to curry paste. But you can actually make this your own, on your own. I make a green uh, curry paste at home made from ginger and garlic and cilantro and lemongrass and mint and whatever you have. And I basically just process it in a food processor, put it in a jar and freeze it and just use it whenever I want to. So we're going to go ahead and put, I would say, two tablespoons. Again, my mom's habits are kicking in, I'm just kind of looking at it and measuring it with my eyes. And I'm going to add a little bit of fluid in there. As you can see, I'm not adding a ton of fluid right away because I want to take some time to caramelize the onions and the ginger and the garlic along with the curry paste and slowly and gradually add it in different layers. And once it starts cooking, you don't really have to cook it anymore. It smells amazing, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. I, have, I have someone who's really motivating me here. Thank you. Awesome. Wonderful. Now, to this, we're going to add a little bit, as if it wasn't enough spices, we're going to add a little bit of turmeric. Now, let me tell you something really excited about turmeric. Turmeric is a magical spice. It really is. Um, when, uh, when we were the directors of brain health at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, one of the studies that we conducted was on the effect of turmeric on deposition in nerve cells. So we would give people curcumin, which is an active component of turmeric, lots of it. And then the next day or two days later, we would do a retinal scan on them. And believe it or not, curcumin actually deposited in their retina. You could actually see turmeric depositing in their retina. And the theory is, and we're still doing research on it, we believe that curcumin has the ability to sit on amyloid beta protein, which is the bad protein associated with Alzheimer's disease, and absorb it. It has a very, very potent anti-inflammatory quality to it. And especially if it's added with a pinch of black pepper, which is pepperin, the component in black pepper, its absorption or bioavailability is increased by 2,000%. So it's an amazing spice to have and an amazing thing to consume. Of course, there are some people who have kidney stones or some gallbladder issues, and they should be really careful. So it should be done after you have a conversation with a healthcare provider to see if you don't have any side effects or any health issues that would stop you from eating turmeric. But, you know, curries, adding turmeric to a latte. You know, we make an almond latte with a little bit of curry, um, turmeric, a pinch of cinnamon, a pinch of cloves with some monk fruit sweetener, not regular sugar, and it just tastes so good. So it's wonderful. And for those who actually can't, you know, consume turmeric on a regular basis, it's okay to actually take a turmeric supplement too. But again, under the supervision of a healthcare provider. So this looks beautiful. As you can see, wonderful. So what I'm going to do now, we've added our turmeric and the curry paste. Now we're actually going to add our vegetables. So I have some cut up butternut squash. This is about two cups. But guess what? You can put any vegetable. You can use this base and add broccoli. You could add sweet potatoes. You could add cauliflower. I, I add um, a lot of legumes where we're going to use some chickpeas here. But you can add whatever you want and it will taste absolutely delicious. To that we're going to add about two cups of vegetable broth. And the reason I'm doing that is because this vegetable seems to be a little tough, right? You want to actually give it an opportunity to soften up. Um, but if it were bro broccoli, you probably wouldn't add two cups, right? You would just add maybe half a cup of broth and just let it steam and it would be ready. So now, let me see if I have a lid. No, I don't have a lid, but that's okay. So we're going to let this soften up on high heat. Is this thing working? Yes, it is. It was just cold. So while this actually heats up, let me tell you about amazing legumes, beans. People are afraid of beans. Who eats beans on a regular basis? Whoa, okay, I'm in the right crowd. Who eats beans or legumes every day? 
I am in the right crowd. You guys are amazing. So legumes are beans, lentils. These are foods that have a beautiful combination of um, fiber, uh, clean plant-based protein, magnesium, so many micronutrients, and it's just an incredible food to have. So you have so many different kinds of beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, black beans, pinto beans, different kinds of lentils, red lentils, black lentils, soybeans, you know, tempeh and tofu are also in the legume family. And guess what? Peanuts are also in the legume family, which Dean just found out. <laughs> we had, we had an enlightening moment there. And it's an amazing food group. And I want to spend some time talking about it because unfortunately there's been a lot of bad press on legumes and beans. The concept of lectins keeps coming back on over again. Anybody's heard about lectins being bad for you? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who say that lectins actually are the origin of most of our diseases, whether it's cancer or diabetes or dementia. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of scientific evidence that supports that, and I'm being kind here. Um, you, lectins are something that you know, they essentially disappear when you cook beans, when you cook legumes. And so we're not really consuming lectins because they, they disappear. They're, they're not even an issue. Who eats raw beans, by the way? Nobody eats raw beans and raw lentils. They're such an amazing food to consume. There have been multiple studies that show that when people consume legumes, you know, two to three servings per day, they have reduced risk of diabetes. They actually have lower weight. They tend to regulate their glucose metabolism better because it has so much resistant starches and complex carbohydrates that it doesn't shoot up your glucose levels right away. It slowly and gradually releases glucose so that your brain and your body can use it properly. You know, our brain is kind of fussy. It just wants to be spoon-fed with glucose, which is the most important nutrient for it. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're just going to let this steam a little bit better. But when, um, when, when, we, when we consume processed foods, you know, that spoon-feeding is thrown out of the window. You just kind of have this overshoot of glucose into your circulation, and your body goes into a frenzy, and it doesn't know what to do with it. And that's when the damage actually starts. But glucose is so amazing. They've actually done studies that when people eat something that is very processed and high sugar, like a donut, right? Somebody has a donut, but right before that they had a bean burrito. The effect of the sugar coming from the donut was stunted because of the complex carbohydrate in your guts. And speaking of guts, all that wonderful complex carbohydrates actually feeds the gut microbiota, the microbes that are in our gut bacteria that actually support our body and especially the brain. We have a very tight junction. I'm kind of getting sciencey here, but this will be the last one. We'll go, get back to our curve very soon, letting this to uh, soft up. So we have this tight junction in the arteries that go into the brain, and it's called the blood-brain barrier, right? This is such a tight junction that not even medication or bacteria or substances can seep through. That's how hermetic the brain is. And guess what keeps the, my, the uh, blood-brain barrier intact? These are short-chain fatty acids that come from our gut microbiome. And if we eat fiber, if we eat beans, if we eat vegetables that are high in fiber and whole grains, that blood-brain barrier stays intact. So you don't have problems like, you know, encephalopathy or dementia or stroke and things of that nature. So in many ways, there's so many studies that I will be sharing with you all with references to show you that when people eat legumes on a regular basis, they tend to do well. That's why the Mediterranean diet is being touted so much because most of, their, most of the food elements are actually beans and whole grains. All right, so beans are amazing. Don't listen to people who scare you about lectins. That's not even an issue. All right, now let's see. I'm just going to test it a little bit. Oh, already soft. Perfect. So you're going to spend, you know, maybe about 10 minutes or so to let this soften up. And it has softened up a little bit. I'm sorry if I taste it with my fingers. I usually do that. It's important for you to taste your food every step of the way to see what it needs. Does it need, you know, more curry paste? Does it need more ginger? Does it need more garlic? But I think this is good. Now, 
If you notice, I didn't add any salt here. I'm not going to add any salt. You can actually cook without salt. What I'm going to use is some coconut aminos. Now there's these different seasoning sauces, you know, whether it's coconut aminos or liquid aminos or low sodium soy sauce that are very flavorful. And they have, so, you know, we have different kinds of tastes. We have sweet, salty, we have spicy, and then there's a type of taste that is called umami. Anybody heard of umami? Umami is a Japanese word, which basically is a combination of all of these things. And umami is usually found in things like mushrooms, in meat, in, in very complex flavors. And this liquid amino brings that umami into the recipes, and it also brings a little bit of saltiness. So we're just going to add a little bit of coconut aminos here. Just checking, making sure. Sorry, guys, I'm not going to measure anything. I'm just going to use my eyes, and we're just going to shake that in there. And then on top of this, this is actually ready. It's nice and soft. You don't want it to become mashed uh, butternut squash. You want to have a little bit of integrity in it. Now we're going to add our wonderful legumes. I have two cans of drained chickpeas here. And I'm going to add both of them. Now, if you have all of these ready, and if you don't talk as much as I do, this thing is going to be ready in 20 minutes at night. All right, so we're going to go ahead and put the cover back on and let this, let the chickpeas and the butternut squash get to know each other. You know, just some introduction, talking to each other. Hello, how are you? And then we're going to get the rest ready. So for flavor, we have some herbs. I have some cilantro, which is beautiful. Herbs, pound for pound, have the most anti-inflammatory components. They're such beautiful things. And if you all can do one thing is consider growing an herb garden because it's the easiest thing and the most gratifying thing too. It's like your little you know, children just kind of growing up. I, I absolutely love growing an herb garden. So we have some uh, cilantro. They don't look very happy because they were sitting here for a while, but I promise you it's good. And I don't want you to get rid of the stem. Most of the flavor is actually in the stem. The leaves are kind of pretty, but the stem do most of the work. So try to chop them and get that ready and add it there. And of course, you know, texture is very important. You don't want any weird texture coming under your teeth. So learn how to chop them very, very well so that they really blend in with everything else. I'm just going to use the stems here and I'm going to leave the rest as a garnish so that they can show off, but most of the work is done by the stem. So I'll just put this in the side and leave it. And then now is the time for us to add the herbs. I'm not going to wait for the chickpeas to cook because they're already cooked, all right? So we're going to add the wonderful cilantro there. And I'm also going to chop, this is mint, and this is going to be for garnish too. You don't have to add both cilantro and mint, but you can do whatever you want if you have Chopped oregano, that would work just fine too. So get in, get in the habit of adding herbs on top of most of your um, dishes because not only does it bring a beautiful aroma, but it also is a potent medicine. You know, food is medicine. This, what we're eating right now is medicine. It provides the right environment for your brain to grow and thrive. You're not going to feel tired. You know, have you ever felt tired after a heavy meal? There are meals that just make you feel so tired that you're just ready to go to bed. Not this one. This one will make you jump out of your chair and ready to take on another activity during the day. And that's what we want. That's what we want. We want to feel energetic. We want to be sharp. We want to be focused. We want to be attentive. So that if you're talking to me, I'm going to pay attention to you and I'm going to listen to your story and I'm not going to forget you. That's what we want from our lives. All right, perfect. So this is essentially ready. Now, what does curry have usually? Curry has this creamy texture. The creaminess comes from, most of the time, coconut. Coconut milk or some sort of a cream base. A lot of restaurants, you know, put dairy-based creams. But what we're going to do is put a nut-based cream. Now, I have some cashew cream that the kitchen wonderfully just prepared. I know it doesn't really show what it is, but let me tell you about cashews. Do you know what cashews are? Most of you guys, hopefully. So cashews are a tree nut, and they have this beautiful quality that when you soak them and when you blend them, they almost become like, um, like, a, like milk. You know, it, it just becomes like cream. So this is about, I believe it's about half a cup of cashews mixed with about three quarters of water. 
right? And you blend it in a blender or in a Nutribullet, and it becomes this beautiful base that doesn't really taste like anything, and that's what you want. You don't want anything. You, don't, you want it to be bland so that the features and the flavors of the curry come out. And the reason I'm not adding coconut milk is because we have some problems with coconut. I mean, it's delicious, and if you want to have it once in a while, that's fine. But the one thing that keeps coming back over and over again in different studies is that saturated fat, not all fats, but saturated fat has been associated with a lot of inflammation and oxidative problems in the body. And saturated fats are found in meats, cheeses, in butter, other dairy products, and in the plant world, coconut oil and coconut milk. So to live an optimal life and to have an optimal meal, we'll try to reduce saturated fats as much as we can. And cashews tend to have more polyunsaturated fats. Uh, and so this is a better um, choice for curry basis. And it's not difficult to make once you get used to it, and you don't really have to use a lot of um, um, cashews for this as well. All right, I'm looking around to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Yeah, so now I'm going to get that lime ready. So look at all the flavors we added. We added the curry paste, the ginger, the garlic, the onions. We added the herbs. We have the vegetable broth. And now we're going to add our cashew cream. Look how beautiful this is. Can you imagine this on a big bowl of brown rice? Wouldn't that taste good? Right? So if, if I were home, I would probably chop a couple of serrano peppers in there too. But Dean says I go wild with chilies and with spices, so I'm, I'm being a little conservative here. But you could add some crushed red pepper or some serrano chili just to bring out that heat. It's just so beautiful. Look how gorgeous that looks. Even right now, it looks absolutely beautiful. Right? So now we're going to go ahead and add greens. Now greens, let me tell you about greens. I think you guys already know greens are good. But did you know that when you consume greens, your brain can look 11 years younger compared to those who don't eat greens? 11, not one, not two, not three, 11 years. This was a study that was done um, from a very large population, a women's health study, and they found out that women who consumed one serving of grain. One serving of grain is about, you know, one to one and a half cups of raw greens or half a cup of cooked greens. When they consumed greens and they did MRI studies and they did neuropsychological testing on them, they actually had better looking brains. We do so much. Women, we do so much for our hair and makeup, don't we? We look at all of these products. We have these skin rituals. I wish we knew how important it is to add greens for a better looking brain. So let's do it. And so here, we added the greens and now, this is essentially ready. I'm going to turn off the heat because you don't want to cook the greens too much. Cooking them makes it, you know, just kind of gets rid of some of the benefits, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're cooking Swiss chards or something a little tough, that's absolutely fine. And now I'm going to add some lime for more flavor, of course. Okay, and this is the time where you're going to test and see how it tastes. I have a lemon squeezer usually, so <laughs> I'm not used to this, but this is good. Oh, lovely. All right, so all I smell right now is the smell of ginger, garlic, um, of the lime, of the curry paste. It's just unbelievably beautiful. All right. And that's it. This freezes very well. You can freeze it for weeks and just warm it up as needed. And there you go. Ta-da! We have a beautiful butternut squash chickpea curry with spinach and herbs. And it's lovely. Perfect. Hope you enjoy it for dinner. All right. Because now we have to make the second one. So the second recipe is a salad. Now, salads don't have to be boring. You know, the, there was a time when um, Dean and I, when we went all plant-based, and that was about 18 years ago. 
And, you know, when you go to restaurants, back then it was difficult to eat plant-based in restaurants. Now they have so many options. And we would ask for a salad. And do you guys remember the sad salad, you know, with the wilted lettuce with a really sad piece of tomato on top and, you know, maybe a raw piece of, like, thick cut onion? Ooh, it was horrible. But things have changed, and salads don't have to be boring or sad. Salads are amazing. And let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about kale. So kale happens to be one of the dark, leafy, green vegetables, which is actually not a leafy vegetable. It's actually a cruciferous vegetable, like like, um, broccoli, like cauliflower, like Brussels sprouts. So this is an amazing vegetable, which has chemicals that helps your arteries heal. There's a chemical compound called sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is found in mostly in Brussels sprouts and broccoli, but also in kale. And what it does is it actually fights against free radicals, you know, all the antioxidants that are created during the day because we're so, our body and our brain is so busy. You have to make sure that you provide it with things that it just calms it down and functions properly. So, and it also has omega-3 fatty acids. Can you believe it? This, this humble little kale actually has good fats in them. And The fiber, the sulforaphane, the omega-3 fatty acids makes it a superfood. I don't believe in superfoods, you know, because we don't eat one food at a time. We eat multiple foods, and it's the synergy between these foods, like the curry, that works best. All right, so what I do is I basically hold the stem. No tricks here. Chef AJ has all the tricks. I don't have any tricks. And we're just going to get rid of the tough part of uh, of the kale. This is called dino kale or dinosaur kale. Why? because it looks like a dinosaur skin, doesn't it? It looks very tough and kind of, you know, my, do- my daughter usually said, I don't think we can eat that, Mom. I remember her saying that the first time she saw it. But when, when you do a little bit of massaging, especially with lemon, and, you know, just let it sit for a couple of minutes, you have the best-looking kale ever. And so what we're going to do is basically just, you know, get rid of the tough uh, parts like that, and we're going to keep this because I usually make a lot of vegetable broth from the stems. You don't have to throw them away at all. No waste here. You're going to keep it, but we're just going to use this, the, the leaf parts. So this is a lot of fun and meditation for me. I usually do it without talking, but if you can, you know, get yourself to eat this more often, that's amazing. There are other types of kills as well. You probably must have seen the typical kind of kale. Now, one is not better than the other, but There's one thing about vegetables. The darker the color, the better. The color comes from polyphenols or flavonoids. These are chemical compounds that have antioxidants. Uh, And when I say antioxidants, think of them as little soldiers that go around in your your body and your brain, and it just kind of fights against, you know, radical products or some inflammatory products that start damaging the brain. So, you know, the darker it is, the better, which basically means things like uh, red cabbage or purple cabbage is better than green cabbage, you know, or things like red onion is actually better than yellow and white onion. So anything that has darker color is much better. All right, so we're going to take this and we're going to roughly chop it. You don't want long strands of kale in your salad. You want to make sure that it's edible. A lot of people like eating healthy. I don't think anybody says, I don't want to eat healthy. All of us want to eat healthy. But it's either the texture or the size or the taste that's not good. Where's my knife right here? And so if you can actually work around making it edible by cutting it, by blending it, by adding things to it, and just changing the texture of the vegetable, The most important thing that I learned in cooking school was not how to make cashew cream or how to mix flavors. It was how do you present food that when you put it, when you put that morsel in your mouth, it feels like a festival and a party and not something that you really have to work hard into liking. And it comes down to cutting it into the right pieces, making sure that all the pieces of everything that you put in there is the same. You don't want your lettuce to be this big 
in your tomatoes to be that small, right? For example, in a soup, you have to make sure that you cut everything with this in the same size. You can't have big pieces so that you can cut the, you know, you're busy cutting the potatoes, but then the noodles are small enough that just go in you. So it's all about making sure that they're the right size and the right texture. All right, so here, I'm not, I won't call it magic, but look at this. So this looks pretty tough right now. All I'm going to do is basically put some acid in there, all right? So we're going to add either some lime or a lemon. I'm just going to use this little piece of lime that I have there. And I'm just going to give this a really nice massage. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. And after you give it a little bit of massage, you actually help break down the cellulose or that little harsh texture that it has. You could do this by adding a little bit of salt in there too, but we're not going to do that. You don't have to. Just the act of massaging it and adding a little bit of salt in there actually makes a huge difference. So once you do that, you actually leave it alone. You leave it alone and you just let it relax and do its thing while you get all the other ingredients ready. So this is a wonderful salad that um, has apple and it has fennel. It kind of has some of the flavors, uh, winter flavors in there as well, right? So have you had fennel? Anybody had fennel? Amazing. I love fennel and especially the fennel fronds. So we're going to make sure that we don't waste anything. And as far as fennel is concerned, it tastes very, very good when it's baked. And you bake fennels, uh, it's, it's wonderful. I got to thank you so much. But you can actually eat it raw as well. It smells incredible. Again, what are the benefits of fennel? Just like any other vegetable, it has lots and lots of fiber. And what do we want to increase in our food? More fiber for those short-chain amino facet, uh, acids so that it can protect our brain and the blood-brain barrier. And so for this one, I have this really nice slicer here, but I could actually probably use my knife as well. We're going to make a very, very thin strands of this. Strands or just kind of shred it here like that. But if you don't have a mandolin slicer, you could probably just do this with your knife as well. I'm going to be super careful not to cut myself here. Like that. It looks gorgeous. All right. Perfect. And I'm going to put that in there. Looks beautiful. You want to add some color to it. And for color, I chose to add a little bit of carrots, shredded carrots. And I'm grateful that somebody shredded that already for me over here. And we're going to shred some apple too. So green apples are wonderful because it brings that tartness, but you could probably use any kind of apple. You can actually use any kind of fruits. You can add mangoes, you can add peaches, depending on the season where you are. You can add whatever fruit is available. Adding fruit to a salad is, is such a great idea. Three things actually. Add a fruit, add some nuts, and add either a crunchy material like baked, you know, whole wheat bread, breadcrumbs to bring out the different textures in a salad and make it really, really palatable. Uh, there it is. Beautiful. I'm trying not to waste as much as I can. Perfect. Look how gorgeous that looks. We're going to put that in there. Now, for the dressing. Let's talk about dressings. So unfortunately, most of the dressings that are found in store, they're just packed with salt, sugar, so many other preservatives. I don't see why we need to buy uh, you know, dressings. You can make a wonderful dressing at home, and it's so easy. Lemon, some herbs, some water, some vinegar, apple cider vinegar or some wine vinegar, whatever you have, combination of these can actually make a beautiful dressing. And, you know, although we're not for eating, drinking juice, we actually want people to consume more unprocessed fruits, but adding a little bit of juice to dressing, there's really nothing wrong with that. So for this one, I think I had a juicer here. Perfect. I'm just going to juice this orange here, and it brings a beautiful citrusy flavor with some sweetness too. So you don't have to add any sugar to your dressing. And it's an amazing way of adding more flavor to your salad. Perfect. So there goes the, uh, the orange juice. Oh, it's a little spot right here. Look how gorgeous that looks. 
Amazing, isn't it? And now to that, we're going to add a little bit of lime, which I ran out of, which is fine. We can actually add a little bit of um, lemon juice right here. And to this, you can add maybe some coconut aminos, just to kind of bring some flavor, or some other acidic uh, uh, substance like apple cider vinegar, all right? So I'm just going to add a touch of liquid aminos here, and that's it. And that's basically it. Really, don't, you don't have to add any oil into it. If you want to, that would be fine, but you actually don't have to. Now, the kale was sitting for a little bit. Now I'm actually going to add this beautiful dressing on top of it like that and give it a shake with the spoon that I have right here. I know that it sounds very simplistic, but once you taste the beautiful mixture of these vegetables, because they all have their own flavors and textures, the sweetness from the apple, the crunch from the carrots, the beautiful texture of the kale. The kale has a little bit of bitterness that, balance, that is just balanced so beautifully with everything else. Now this is just, oops, this is just a flavor bomb right here. And the longer it actually sits, the softer it will become. So you can actually make this in the morning and just cover it and consume it for dinner later on. I'm sorry, your hands are getting tired. No, no, I'm just going to go like this. <laughs> You're more than welcome to. All right. So for texture, we're actually going to add a couple of more things. I have different types of seeds over here. This is an amazing opportunity to add seeds to our recipe. Now, why seeds? Seeds are an excellent source of omega-3 fatty acids. If there's one fat that we need in our food, it's omega-3 fatty acids. So things like flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds are wonderful. And then all of these other ones, like the sunflower seed right here, and we have some pumpkin seed. You don't have to have all of them, but I just wanted to kind of show you the variations of the seeds that you can add to salads. It's an amazing way of adding taste, flavor, and good fats that help build your brain. And that's basically it, guys. You're going to have this for dinner tonight. And it's just this beautiful combination of a fruit, some vegetables, some seeds. And as I said, you can actually store this for a while and serve it later. These are easy foods that you can put together. Do you think you can put together these kind of meals for a weekday meal, night? Amazing, amazing. So food is not just food. It's medicine. Oh, thank you so much for, for watching. <laughs>